Hey, this is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek. 74 years ago, the last general strike happened in Oakland, California. And today, as labor councils around the country, and even the Vermont State AFL-CIO, have called for a general strike if Trump does not leave office and tries to do a coup, the issue of general strikes and what they are and what happened 74 years ago is important for working people today. And joining us is Gifford Hartman. He's a researcher and labor historian who has been covering the Oakland general strike. He walks uh, every year as part of Labor Fest and is very knowledgeable about the Oakland general strike. And it's really important to give a little bit of the background. So this is 1946. It's in the post-World War II period. The war ended in 1945, as everyone knows. And immediately, there was a wave of strikes. And the strikes really you know, went across the country, covered almost every work sector. And they really began in 1945. And perhaps we could say they really peaked in 1946. And then there were some other changes that happened in society. As you remember, the war ends, and it, at least 12 million people get decommissioned from the war effort, many of whom are getting shipped back to the ports of the Bay Area as they're coming back to civilian life. So there's these increased surges in labor, demand, you know, people who need work, but as the war economy winds down, people are getting laid off. So there's this increasing amount of people who are unemployed. And against that, um, the bosses, the ruling class, remember what had happened at the end of World War I, and they really wanted to push again what they called their open shop drive. They wanted to basically crush labor, they wanted to crush unions, and they wanted to go back to calling the shots because the conditions during World War II had been kind of locked in. There were wage controls and price controls, and there was a tripartite um, part of the government between labor, the, um, the companies, and the government that kind of set those wages and prices and things like that. Well, when World War II ended, those regulations lifted. So the price controls were lifted, prices shot up. The wage controls were lifted, and the, and the bosses wanted to keep wages down. And that was one of the main tensions that actually created the impetus for this strike wave, the waves is in the plural, but also what came, ended up resulting in a series of general strikes in various cities. And so the anger that was really catalyzed by this ruling class attack on work, working class conditions um, was one of the forces that drove the strikes. But then people still remember the 30s. And you know, I'm sure you talk about it on your show. The 30s was this incredible time of just insurgencies, factory occupations, waves of strikes in the midst of the Great Depression. When work, the working class was facing some of the worst conditions in history, 1933, there was 24.9% unemployment. So one of four people were out of work, people fought back. And, and the, you know, refuting the, the mythology that the New Deal was Roosevelt's benevolence, it wasn't true. The working class pushed Roosevelt to concede and buy social peace with the New Deal. That was still in the living memories of people. So when we come into 1946, we're facing people with a living memory of struggle. Some of it had really been dampened down during World War II, but then when the, all the regulations that had kind of allowed people to kind of survive through the sacrifice of World War II were lifted and the ruling class really did go to attack, um, people fought back. And let me just give you some facts. So um, um, there were strikes that started at the end of World War II. Um, they were um, oil workers, coal miners, textile workers, farm implement manufacturers, electrical worker, meat packing workers, packing house workers, and they were just striking across the country. So that was began after World War II ended. And as we entered the year 1946, there was one of the biggest single industry strikes in US history. 750,000 steel workers went out on strike and, um, in January of 46, and that just rolled over. There were strikes by coal miners, two different kinds of coal, the bituminous coal and the soft coal, they both went out at the same time. Railroad workers went out on strike and it nearly created a general strike because the main source of energy still was coal and the railroad was the main for form of transportation. So with no energy and no transportation, the economy almost ground to a halt. So workers were generally winning the strikes. The bosses were increasing wages and the fight was really intensifying. Now, the coal strike in the winter of 1945-46 was so intense that Truman threatened to bring in troops 
to operate the coal mines. And the coal miners said, yeah, um, let's see the soldiers try and mine coal with bayonets. It didn't work. So the coal miners had been one of the most militant sectors who all through World War II actually didn't abide by the no strike pledges and continue to strike. So we have this whole setting where um, the country's volatile, there's strikes breaking out everywhere. Um, but then the, 19th, the November 1946 elections, there was a, a, a pushback. The Republicans won both houses of Congress for the first time since 1930. And so there's this reactionary reaction to what had been happening. So the Republicans want to rein it in. They want to regulatorily rein in the working class. But at the same time, people are in their factories, people are in the streets, they're protesting. So there were general strikes in six different cities. Oakland was the last of that period. The first one was in Stanford, Connecticut, um, machinists, um, then there were transportation workers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, municipal employees who worked in Houston, Rochester, New York, also people who worked in the public utility, um, electrical workers in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and then finally we come to Oakland. And so um, there were, you know, downtown Oakland used to be the hub of the East Bay. It was where everybody went to shop. And, you know, from the pre-war period, and this is just immediately after World War II, not many people had cars. So if anybody wanted to shop, they'd either jump on a bus or jump on a streetcar and go to downtown Oakland. And still today, the heart of downtown Oakland is the intersection where Broadway and Telegraph converge in a triangle that's called Latham Square. Well, on both sides of Latham Square, there were two department stores. Um, on one side was the, um, the Cons department store, which was the biggest department store in all of Oakland. It was a um, multiple story building. The building's still there. It's called the Rotunda Building. It had as many as 800 employees um, and they were striking for things that classically people were fighting for across the country in this whole strike wave. And that was stable conditions, higher wages, um, a union just for protections against just the egregious practices of management. But one important thing is stability. Is At the time, in the basement of the cons department store, there was something called the ready room, which is basically like a shape up. And the classic story in the waterfront where longshore workers would have to go in the morning and be picked out based on favoritism, based on not fighting for their rights or being troublemakers, similar conditions in the basement of the department store. Mostly women clerks were working there. They'd show up in the morning, they'd get, you know, some had their departments where they worked, but if there was a shortage in this huge department store, um, people would go to the basement and they would just be waiting for work. And if there was no work, they would just be sent home with no pay. And so they, the, the mostly women who were working as clerks in the department store knew that if they had a union contract, they could, determined that everyone had a stable job with benefits and were assured of work. So that was cons. Across the street was a men's department store called Hastings that had 100 employees. Um, Hastings was 100% union. They voted to join local 1265 of the specialty and retail, retail clerks union. And cons was a majority. It was a huge department store. I, I, again, I said a number, I'm not really sure. I know they had hundreds of workers. And um, a majority, overwhelmingly, over 90% of the workers had um, signed union cards. And both management of both stores refused to negotiate with the union. Because at the time, there were 22 department stores in downtown Oakland, and they had something called the Retail Merchants Association. The Retail Merchants Association, using the tactics of the post-World War I open shop, said they wouldn't negotiate with any union until every department store was organized which was an impossible task because there were large department stores, like I said, cons, there was something that existed well into the, um, the later half of the 20th century called Capwells, HB Capwells, other big department stores, but also smaller like Hastings, you know, specialty stores. And they knew because of the uneven size of the different stores, it would be really impossible to have unionization of all the stores. So they knew that was a stalling tactic by management and the unions persevered. So the unions actually went and decided to go out on strike. So um, the first department store to go out on strike was Hastings, the men's department store went out on October 23rd. The entire staff went out, as I said, it was 100% unionized. Across the street, the bigger multi-level um, department store cons went out 
on October 31st. At this time, the strikes were incredibly effective. Um, there was a adage that old militants would talk about from the 30s into this period, that when somebody set up a picket line, it was as effective as a barbed wire fence. And largely, the working class community of Oakland did not cross the picket line. And so remember, this is at the end of October. So the strike continues through October. Largely popular, there was you know, nationwide agitation among workers. Um, and then other groups started to support it. The NAACP supported the strike. Um, the other, the Labor Council supported the strike. The Building Trades Council stopped working on elevators and stopped doing renovations to the department stores. They honored the picket lines, they honored the strike. Um, the Labor Council took up a fund, workers gave a dollar a month towards the strike fund, and strike was succeeding. Um, and through, through all of November, we get to a period that's just like right now, is it's right pushing up onto the, um, the Thanksgiving holiday, which was even back then was the beginning of the Christmas shopping season. The shelves were running empty in those two department stores and they realized that they had to stock up for the Christmas rush, but they had a strike going on and people weren't crossing the picket line and Teamsters weren't crossing the picket line and weren't delivering goods into the store. So as I said, the shelves were empty. So management in collusion with the city elite in, in Oakland decided that they were gonna break the, break the strike. They were gonna scab her through the picket lines. And what they did is in the AM hours of December 1st, 1946, they hired a company, it was called GI Trucking. It was from Los Angeles. It was notorious for strike breaking. And there was even a reputation that they came armed. Never found out if that happened or not. But so starting in the AM hours of Sunday, December 1st, the police with multiple police cars, police motorcycles started escorting scab trucks through the streets of Oakland to restock Cons and Hastings department stores. Now, they also pulled a kind of a shell game. People were expecting the trucks to bring some of the goods from the South, but there used to be a department store on Shattuck Avenue in downtown Berkeley called Hinks, and they had a warehouse in West Berkeley and that's where they stored the surplus goods that they were gonna put in these two downtown open department stores. And so people protested and there were phone trees and unionists and militants and just working class people who lived within proximity to downtown Oakland came and tried to stop the breaking of the strike. And they were unsuccessful because the police forces were just numerically greater than they were. So that was Sunday. Um, even, there was even an incident where um, a cop tricycle ran over a worker who was there prote protesting. His name was Newton Selvage. He was sent to the hospital. And the word of mouth news of that just angered people. So not only did they run over somebody and send him a worker who was protesting in solidarity, send him to the hospital, the anger catalyzed. And so the next morning was Monday, December 2nd, the first work, work day after the weekend. And um, people decided, many of whom, decided not to go to work. There was no official declaration of a strike, but the streetcar drivers who would converge at that triangular intersection of Broadway and Telegraph, um, it was really the hub of the transportation system of the whole East Bay. The streetcar system was called the key route system. They came, they saw that there were still police picket lines. There were still more, the next day, there were still more scab goods and scabbing attempts to break the strike attempted. And the streetcar drivers refused to cross through pulled the controls out of their streetcars. The streetcars lined up on the track, disabled. They got out. Buses pulled over to the curb and said, what's going on? People explained that there was still a police cordon trying to break the strike. The militant transportation workers said, we don't break strikes. We don't cross picket lines. We refuse to move through that triangular intersection where the two department stores are across from each other. And they said the police cordon was a picket line and they wouldn't cross. No sooner did that happen as just regular um, people riding the transportation to get to work. This is in the AM hours of Monday morning, were stranded. Truck drivers saw the stranded streetcars. They saw the buses lining up, people coming out, converging on the corners of the streets. They parked their trucks and refused to move too. And so really the spark that began the Oakland general strike was on Monday, December 2nd, when people just refused to work. And transportation workers refused to go through police cordons considering it a picket line. 
So that really sparked it. People said maybe 10,000 people gathered in downtown Oakland, bolstered the picket lines of the two department stores. And from there, that evening, the Labor Council met near unanimously, there was some dissent, but near unanimously decided to call for a general strike for the whole East Bay. So officially, the Oakland general strike began on December 3rd, a Tuesday, in the AM hours. So when work started, it was a general strike. So it ended up affecting 142 unions. One union was given an exception. It was the milk wagon drivers union, something I can't remember specifically the name. They figured that milk was needed for hospitals and for, you know, for young children. So they allowed that union to have an exception and continue work, but nearly every other, especially all the AFL unions shut down work. Now the CIO didn't come on board and that was a weakness. Yet, wherever the AFL set up a picket line, if there was a big facility that may have had people from both union federations, the CIO workers did not cross. So for example, there was newspapers in the East Bay and for each newspaper, they set up a picket line. Mostly the people who worked in the press room were CIO, they didn't cross. And one effectiveness of the 46th general strike is every East Bay newspaper was shut down. So let me just give you a quick list. That would be the, um, if you just bear with me for just a second, um, the, um, and, and give me just a second, this will take me a second. So the newspapers were the Berkeley Daily Gazette, shut down, picket line in front, shut down. Alameda Times Star, picket line in front, shut down. Hearst Post Inquirer in downtown Oakland, picket line went up, it shut down. Most importantly, the real power brokers of the Republican Party that ran the city of Oakland in 1946 were the Nolan family. Um, some people have compared them to kind of like the right-wing Republican Kennedys. They were a dynasty, the father and the son were both in and out of Congress, in and out of power, and they basically were the ruling class of Oakland. And they had a newspaper called the Oakland Tribune, and that was shut down. So one of the effective, most effective things of the 46 Oakland general strike is not only allowing uh, not allowing the, the mainstream corporate press to malign the strike, every newspaper was shut down, but every business was shut down. And so, um, you know, kind of the more um, inspiring things that happened is people started gathering on street corners and started directing traffic. And um, they made a rule. Restaurants were gonna close, bars could stay open if they didn't serve hard liquor and they put the jukebox out on the street and, and people were actually dancing on the streets of Oakland in the early AM hours as they began the 46 Oakland general strike. So there was these really inspiring parts to it. Now, it continued and it continued and like I said, it, it was effective. Every AFL union in the East Bay effectively shut down. Anytime there was a picket line in front of a workplace that involved CIO workers, it shut down. Um, the East Bay Highway, East Shore Highway was called at the time. They set up picket lines at the border of Berkeley and the South End at San Leandro. It shut down any transportation. Trucks tried to come into er Oakland, they were turned away. So it was incredibly effective. And the strike continued. The weakness, and this is probably the analysis, is the weakness of the strike is workers made it happen, but behind the scenes, the people in the Labor Council negotiated, and they negotiated with the city elite at something called the Athens Club, which was a private gentleman's club behind closed doors. And there was a news blackout. Nobody knew on either side how the negotiations proceeded. And the, the manage, management represented by just the people from the various factions of the ruling class didn't budge. And it continued officially on Tuesday, officially on Wednesday, it was raining. Despite the rain, people still continued to flood into downtown Oakland. Months before they'd reserved the Oakland Municipal Auditorium, later it was called the Kaiser Auditorium. Now it's the huge auditorium that sits empty across the street from Laney College. They booked one of the big rooms there and they were gonna have a labor meeting to discuss the strike in the early days of the strike. They didn't realize that it would be a general strike meeting and 15,000 people fit into the auditorium to capacity and about another 10,000 people stood outside in the rain listening to the meeting over loudspeaker. And so people you know, talked about the issues of the strike I'm Harry Lunderberg from the Sailors Union of the Pacific 
you know, spoke truth and said that the people running the strike were the grand finks that ran the city. And he even said, you know, what we should do is go down there and take City Hall apart. And people who were there, the witnesses said, if he really would have meant it, people would have gone down to City Hall and dis 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 um, demolished the building brick by brick. Well, they didn't do that, but there was an anger there. And so the meeting, unfortunately, didn't have a plan to continue the strike. They knew the next day was Thursday. They knew that the CIO for Alameda County threatened that if they didn't end the strike and negotiated in the favor of the workers at the department stores, the CIO was going out. And that was kind of a leverage that kind of created a certain fear because the CIO ran things like public utilities, the water, the power, and they even threatened, like, if you don't settle the strike, we'll just shut off water and power. And they never got to that because in the middle of the night, between Wednesday, December 3rd, and Thursday, December 4th, there was a deal that was negotiated. And because there wasn't really any rank and file participation, unlike the 34 San Francisco general strike, where there was a strike committee that included a few militants like Harry Bridges, among the few truly working class militants who were rank and filers, the, um, the negotiators in, for Oakland, for the Alameda Labor Council were almost all the higher level staff people with no input from the rank and file. The deal they cut was a, essentially just to call it what it was, it was a sellout. They got an oath from the city elite to say that they would never again use the police to break a strike. Um, no deal about what was gonna happen with the workers at the stores. Now there was some undermining, people undermining the strike. The Teamsters rank and file were incredibly militant. Back in 34, the first union that literally went out on strike to create the 34 San Francisco general strike were the Teamsters. They actually went out a day before everyone else. They had a history of militancy. You know, some of the militants were still driving trucks in 46, but higher up, especially at the top, um, the leader of Teamsters for the West Coast was a guy named Dave Beck. Now, Dave Beck broke his teeth breaking the 1919 Seattle general strike. He played a really negative role when the Teamster militants were making the 34 waterfront strike on the West Coast and the San Francisco general strike in July of 1934. He tried to undermine it. And, um, um, and Dave Beck representing the Teamster leadership out of Seattle, floated a story in the newspaper that he floated it on Wednesday night and made the papers on Thursday morning. Banner headlines in all the newspapers outside of Alameda County, like in the San Francisco Daily, said strike settled. By declaring that the strike was settled and by a union leader telling the press that the strike was settled, it took the wind out of the sails of the strikers and it really undermined the strike. So to kind of bring the end to the story is, sadly, the strike ended in failure. Yet, you know, there's a lot of takeaways. And the takeaways would be that people rose up, people acted on a spirit of solidarity. Um, what drove the strike was a sense of class consciousness, this whole idea, age old, going even back to the Knights of Labor in the 19th century is an injury to one is the concern of all, or the injury to one is um, an injury to all, is when people felt that their fellow workers were being attacked, they united and they rose up. And it was so powerful, like I said, it was the sixth culminating citywide general strike of 1946 that the political establishment really panicked and more strategized. And in May of 1947, they passed the Taft-Hartley Act. And I'm sure you, Steve, talked about Taft-Hartley. Taft-Hartley was a way to illegalize the kind of general strikes, solidarity actions, and the kind of actions that actually define that whole post-war period. They made, you know, um, mass picketing became illegal. They did crazy things to undermine unions. It was really the beginning of the Cold War. And, um, you know, and, and uh, yet um, people in unions had to sign, sign anti-communist loyalty oaths. It allowed the president to declare an 80-day um, cooling off period to and strikes and push them back to negotiations. It allowed federal courts to, um, to, per, to enforce the provisions of the labor laws, which had kind of been murky and not really clear before. And it really um, 
put the unions under the microscope of government and the courts. And it really did um, as a ruling class attempt to regulate and to make the kinds of strikes that had been happening in this long period illegal. So I do say the legacy is that the last strike yet was 46. We had other actions. I'd say we could say in 2006, when uh, mostly um, immigrant workers rose up against the Censor Brenner Act, HR 4437, and millions of people for May Day, 19, 2006, I would say that was a one day general strike. And so I'd say that was a general strike of another sort. They're still possible. And again, as you began the show, if Trump, tries to pull some kind of crazy, you know, um, not following the provisions of the, of the law and secession to the next president, it's a, it's a tool. Now, I always live by this adage is there's, um, there's no illegal strike, there's only unsuccessful strikes. So I think a general strike is still within the toolkit of the working class because it's based on solidarity and I think it's still possible today. And I think if we looked at what was effective in 46, and then the previous wave, the five other general strikes in 30, 46, the big strikes that happened in 34, there's this whole history of people fighting back we can draw upon. We're talking with Gifford Hartman, and thanks for that uh, presentation on, on the Oakland general strike and what happened in the Oakland general strike. And maybe you can talk about the corporatization of the trade unions, because you mentioned the Taft-Hartley, which was passed by the US government, uh, the Democrats and Republicans, and it emasculated the union's right for secondary boycotts for solidarity pickets, uh, said it was illegal. At the same time, you have a witch hunt, uh, anti-communist witch hunt, uh, purge of uh, CIO unions, of leftists, and the AFL-CIO, which, uh, why don't you talk about that? Because the AFL-CIO, uh, what kind of trade union federation is it? Because it did support corporatism, collaboration, labor management partnerships, which still exist today, uh, supported U.S. and military operations around the world. You think the formation of the AFL-CIO was kind of parallel to the witch hunts? Yeah, no, I think they went hand in hand. Um, and also the CIO was full of radicals. You know, the radicals built the CIO in the 30s. And by this time period, the post-World War II period, as the government attacked first with regulations and making, like you said, all the kinds of effective solidarity actions illegal, they went after the unions and they went after the unions with McCarthy and all the kind of the, the red scare witch hunt tactics. So much so that they actually, the loyalty oath, very few unions stood up to the government and you know stood behind the constitution that guaranteed the rights of all kinds of things like free speech. And um, many of the unions just buckled under and signed the loyalty oaths and purged the leftists and purged the radicals. Um, and very few resisted. And um, by um, 1949, 1950, during that period, 10 unions left the CIO for, for refusing to sign the loyalty oath. Only two remain. One is the ILWU, which has maintained its independence and its militancy ever since. The other, also is an independent, the United Electrical Workers Union, also continued and has continued as an independent union. The only two really lasted those purges, the Red Scare purges. So others conformed and they conformed to all those things you said about um, the corporatization, the, you know, it, it took, it took at some time, it took a generation or more for them to kind of um, have you know, labor management partnerships, which really comes out of like destroying the radical factions within these unions. And it's also part of a larger social attacks on civil rights and things like that. And so it really is, um, the, this is the beginning. This is the period where it begins. And then by the time we get to the, the last probably period of strikes, maybe the late sixties into the early seventies, they were mostly, the militancy was mostly led by militant rank and file because the union leaderships had become so conformist and so willing to go along with management and, and play nice and, um, and not use the strike weapon for what it was possible. Um, and, and really relied on the threat of strikes. And then we reached the point where Reagan gets elected. And when he comes to power in 1980, um, the air traffic controllers, PATCO, go out on strike. He threatens them. And without the other unions or other workers showing them solidarity, he's able to fire 11,000. That really set a tone for his regime 
of being anti-labor and attacking the unions and attacking the working class. And I would say it really hasn't recovered that, you know, since then we've seen uprisings and some inspiring strikes, but largely we've seen the labor movement kind of killed off and especially the, the strike weapon being taken away. It still exists, but it just isn't used. I would say a couple of years ago, the West Virginia teachers really showed what's possible, but they had a heritage of coal miners striking in the late 70s, early 80s. So I'd say there's, it's really exceptional, but I think that we have to revive the strike. And I think, you know, like looking at this history is a way to look at the tools and the effective tactics that actually made these massive strikes possible. Because if we're going to challenge the ruling class, we're going to challenge the Trump administration, it's not going to be a strike here and there. It's going to have to be something coordinated, much like a general strike on a larger scale. And we're speaking with Gifford Hartman. He's a labor historian. And also the, the uh, question of the recent action by the Vermont AFL-CIO to take a vote to have a general strike if uh, Trump refused to leave office. Richard Trumpka, the president of the AFL-CIO, sent an order to the Vermont State AFL-CIO saying it, it was illegitimate and improper for them to take a vote to, to support a general strike if there was a coup. So, I mean, you can imagine, I mean, if, if there's a coup in the United States, it's illegal for your union to take action to fight the coup. You think, who is Richard Trumka representing? I mean, because if we do face a coup in this country, the idea of a national general strike has some real relevance. That's a good question. I can't answer who he is. I just know what he represents. And he represents kind of um, compromise and an ability to kind of like, not put the resources that the working class has, or that we have, you know, the potential of solidarity. He doesn't want to use it. But again, I think that goes back to this whole post-World World War II period where the uh, bureaucracies of the unions became bloated and disconnected from the needs of the rank and file, but they also lost this heritage of striking. Trump guy I know was involved in the 79 Pittston strike, so I know that he has that heritage, but as he's risen up in the labor bureaucracies to the head of the AFL-CIO, I think he's lost any connection to the needs of the working class. I think there's a large disconnect. Is the partnership between the Democratic Party and labor is just, you know, I'm sure he represents a faction of that. That, you know, to, he doesn't want to displease his allies in the Democratic Party by doing something that would defend the working class. And one of the issues uh, the American working class faces now is uh, that Biden, if he does take office, uh, says he wants to, uh, he doesn't want national health care, even though millions of people have lost their, their health care benefits. Uh, there is a, a massive uh, gig economy now uh, with contract workers at Amazon. Amazon has hired uh, hundreds of thousands of workers who are temporary part-time workers, no benefits, no rights. Uh, why are the capitalists so afraid of general strikes uh, happening? Are they worried that these millions of workers who are unorganized will join unions and they won't be afraid of joining a union? Yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly. Like you just said, it is like, look at all the people who work in, as independent contractors, you know, who would be affected by some militant action. Um, and, um, you know, I mean, what is the, the, the union density now is around 10%. So the 90% of the working class might rise up and might actually form organizations to defend themselves. Like you said, you know, here, you, as we know, in California, Prop 22 passed, which codifies this independent contractor status for rideshare drivers, the Uber and Lyft drivers. They went on strike on um, May, 8th, uh, May 8th, 2019, a couple days before Uber's IPO that, you know, sent fear through the, the, the executive suites of people who run these gig economy companies. That's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that we'll get together and we'll get together with the people who are falsely considered not working class with everyone else and the effectiveness of everyone getting together. Now, I'm afraid because as you know, Kamala Harris's brother-in-law is Tony West, who's the lead lawyer for Uber. So the, uh, you know, Thankfully, rhetorically, Kamala Harris was against Prop 22, the, you know, the initiative that made um, gig economy workers into, codified them as independent contractors. And Biden was against 22, but what's he going to do in office? I don't see him as being a friend of the working class. Uh, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, was neutral on Proposition 22, even though the unions 
had supported him, and he actually signed AB5. Yeah, and, yeah. And following the passage of, uh, of 22, you had Roma Lois, who has been, it was removed from the Teamsters Union for corruption uh, and taking uh, money for other officials and attacking union democracy. He, he uh, said he wanted to make a deal with Uber and Lyft. And I understand in New York, uh, these ride share companies have made a deal with the machinist union to have like a, uh, a company union where they collect dues from Uber and Lyft and supposedly represent the workers. Uh, yeah. So this idea of company unionism, is that where some of the unions are going at this point in this country? Yeah, they've been doing it for a long time. You know, um, again, you know, you, I think you said it at the beginning of the interview, just um, labor corporate or labor management partnerships where they act as a one unit, as one entity, as though the union leadership somehow is to impose labor discipline and act as proxies for the boss, and that's wrong. The, the uh, discussion and debate on the general strikes, you think that that's the kind of situation we're going into in this period, that more and more workers see uh, that they have to use their collective power of the entire working class, class against class. You think that's where we're going in this country? I mean, I think so. I think that, you know, we could see it during the beginning of the pandemic with Amazon workers doing wildcat actions all over from Staten Island to Minnesota to Southern California to here in the Bay Area, some Amazon workers did some, essentially, you know, they weren't unionized, but they're, you know, it's a wildcat action. It's self-organized strikes. I think it's going to happen. I think it's already been happening. I think the teachers, like I said, in West Virginia and elsewhere, then in Kentucky and North Carolina and Colorado and Arizona, and, and then in Los Angeles and then in Oakland, set the tone. And I think striking's coming back, but I think it's um, it, as these strikes generalize and they could link up, I think that would be a general strike. And I think it's not only possible, I think it's something we need to push for. I think that as we face, you know, you, uh, we know that Biden's not going to be much friendlier to labor. Well, I mean, okay, so anybody's going to be friendlier to labor than Trump, but Biden's not a friend. He's a moderate, he's a neoliberal. He's, you know, he's going to bring back some of the worst attacks on the working class guys, you know, more smoothly than Trump did. But yeah, this is our only alternative, is joining together and finding ways to fight back. Okay, well, I wanna thank you for joining us on Work Week. We've been talking with Gifford Hartman. He is a labor historian, researcher, and uh, how can people find out more about the Oakland General Strike, Gifford? There's links that are on the Labor Fest page. We do the walk every, at the end of the summer, every July, and we've done it since, I've done it since 2006. There's some good links on the Labor Fest website where you could find, if you find, search to the Oakland General Strike Walk, and then there's a couple links there. Okay, well, thanks for joining us on Work Week, and let's commemorate this Oakland General Strike by remembering the importance of it and the value of collective action by the entire working class. So thanks for joining us on Work Week. Thanks for having me. Solidarity, everyone.